This video was brought to you by Brilliant. On Friday, the Dutch government collapsed amid a row over migration and asylum seekers just 18 months after falling. Then, three days later, on Monday, the Netherlands' longest-serving Prime Minister, Mark Rutte, announced that he wouldn't be running for re-election and would leave politics after 13 continuous years in the top job. So in this video, we'll explain what happened, why the government collapsed, and what might happen next. Before we start, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and ringing the bell to stay in the loop and be notified when we release new videos. First things first, we're going to briefly take a look at the coalition government that just collapsed to give you an overview of the key players in the story. Now, the largest of the four parties in the centre-right coalition is the People's Party for Freedom and Democracy, or VVD, led by Mark Rutte. Then you've got the Democrat 66, or just D66, who are the second largest. The third largest are the Christian Democratic Appeal, or CDA. And the fourth and smallest member of the government is the Christian Union, or CU. Now, together, this coalition holds 77 seats in the 150-seat lower house, which is a pretty narrow majority. Regardless, this government was formed after the March 2021 general election, and is actually a continuation of the coalition that was in power before that election. In fact, during that time, this exact coalition actually collapsed once already, before the 2021 election over a childcare scandal that saw tens of thousands of parents falsely accused of benefit fraud. Anyway, following the subsequent election and nearly 300 days of difficult negotiation, the same four parties agreed to form a new coalition. Given all this, it should come as no surprise that the coalition was somewhat shaky ever since its formation. So with all the key players now explained, let's get into the current dispute over asylum seekers. Now, 46,000 asylum applications were made in the Netherlands last year, which is a jump of a third. And this year, numbers are expected to surpass 70,000. And as is the case in many European states, the government are feeling a political pressure to try and bring this number down. It's not just the numbers either. The Dutch asylum system is not in good shape, with the provision of basic shelter for asylum seekers being particularly problematic. Just last year, a three-month-old baby died in the country's main reception centre for asylum seekers in the village of Ter Apel. And at times, hundreds of asylum seekers have had to sleep on the ground outside of the overcrowded centre. Now, for months, the government negotiated amongst itself to try and come up with a new package of measures to bring down numbers and reduce strain on the system. Rutter and his VVD were pushing to introduce something called a two-status system, which would effectively divide asylum seekers into two tiers, A or B. A status refugees would be those personally at risk of persecution, maybe for things like their political views or sexuality, while those of B status would be people fleeing from war or conflict. Now, the former would be granted permanent residency permits and enjoy more rights, while the latter would only get temporary permits and less rights to things like family reunion. Specifically, the VVD wanted to put a cap on the number of family members, such as children, who could join B-status war refugees in the Netherlands at 200 per month, as well as introducing a two-year mandatory wait period before those relatives could enter the country. Now, this proposal was supported by the CDA. However, for the other two coalition parties, the D66 and particularly the CU, this was unacceptable, with the Christian Union's leader emphasising the party's pro-family stance, saying that there are things you can ask of us, and there are things you cannot ask of us. Now, Rutte was keen for the coalition to come to some sort of agreement swiftly, so set a deadline for the end of last week for a deal to be struck. Multiple crisis talks were then held to try and bring the parties together, but in the end, the ideological differences were too much, with Rutter announcing the collapse of the government by saying that the decision was very difficult for us, but adding that the differences were irreconcilable. So what happens now? 
Well, over the weekend, Mark Rutte submitted the cabinet's resignation to the king. But the Dutch Electoral Commission has said that elections will not be held until mid-November at the earliest due to various laws, holidays and other issues. In part because of this, some have accused Rutter of bringing forward non-negotiable proposals on family reunion with the intention of forcing the collapse of the government. The logic being that this would make the election centred on immigration and help to position his party in the minds of voters as tough on immigration, with the goal of shoring up support and capturing votes from the likes of the hardline anti-Islam, anti-immigration Party for Freedom, or PVV. However, it would be naive to think that immigration will be the sole issue over the coming months. Things like the agricultural sector, climate change, housing, public services, and more will be hotly debated in the run-up to the election. A lot of attention is also on the Farmer Citizen Movement, or BBB, a relatively new party that shot to prominence by supporting farmers' protests against government measures to cut livestock numbers and reduce agricultural pollution. In fact, they stunned the country in March 2023 by winning the country's provincial elections and are now polling ahead, though the numbers have dipped from their peak earlier this year. The question is, though, can this party replicate its provincial election success in a general election? The BBB's party leader says that they're confident they can, saying that all the banners are still in the barns. They can be put back in the fields tomorrow. We just roll from one campaign to the next. Other opposition parties were also clearly keen to prevent Rutter from taking advantage of this early election, with opponents also tabling a no-confidence vote for Monday, with the goal of stopping Rutter from even serving as a caretaker prime minister until the election. However, on Monday, Rutter announced a major decision, with him saying, There has been speculation in recent days about what would motivate me. The only answer is the Netherlands. My position is completely subordinate to it. I've decided that I will not be available as leader for the VVD in the upcoming elections. So it seems that Mark Rutter, nicknamed Teflon Mark for his ability to survive, will end his 13 years as Prime Minister by the next election. What happens next remains to be seen. The VVD will clearly need to find a new leader to take them into the election, as will the leader of the coalition member CDA, who announced their plans to step down after the government collapsed. As for the Dutch left, which has spent a number of years in the wilderness, there's a push to turn around their electoral prospects. The Green Left Party and the Labour Party are now seeking to unite to run a joint list, which, if you combine together their current polling, could make them competitive. However, given the amount of time before the next election, and the fact that a number of parties still need to choose new leaders, there's still a whole lot of time for things to change. And these polling numbers won't necessarily reflect the reality on the day. It's interesting that even as people ostensibly into politics, the TLDR team spends more and more time analysing data and economic information as it becomes more and more critical to our lives. And as a bunch of people who are ordinarily more focused on words than numbers, we've really benefited from the courses on Brilliant.org in order to keep ourselves sharp. That's because Brilliant is the best way to learn maths and computer science in a fun and interactive way. From foundational and advanced maths to AI, data science, neural networks, decision making and more. With new lessons added monthly. Even if, like us, you don't think of yourself as a traditionally STEM kind of person, these courses could prove incredibly useful for your life and career. Courses like Data Analysis and the Fundamentals of Statistics can help anyone ensure that they're properly understanding our increasingly data-driven world. Which is good news when your boss suddenly asks you to analyse a trade war, an economy, or the collapse of a currency. You know, just hypothetically. Anyway, you can try everything that Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days by clicking the link in the description. Plus, the first 200 of you to sign up will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Thanks for your support and for watching TLDR.